please welcome our next speaker, Bogdan Ketsman. Uh, hello, everybody. I'm Bogdan Ketsman. Work for Oracle for 11 years, I think now. These conferences are going. Um, so uh, we're going to talk today about advanced databasing. Now, I'm going to base most of the talk on MySQL and PostgreSQL, but you can use the techniques using any database system. Uh, also, uh, note that I'm not going to show you today how to do anything. I'm just trying to give you some ideas so you can know what to search for around and to, to get you more comfortable to move out of doing things the standard way. Now, since I work for Oracle, I have to go to this one. Everybody knows this if they're following my presentations. Everything I say, my opinion only, you can't uh, pull Oracle you know, for this. You can only sue me if you want to. Also, uh, I never use this join-in thing, but the PDF of the presentation is there. So you can get the PDF and, and look at it. So when we are talking about databases, the systems, everything we do, everything we, we want to get to, what do we want? Get paid at the end of the month? Anything else? So what do our managers want? They want speed, they want availability, they want reliability, they want scalability, they want it to be cheap, they want it to be yesterday, right? Missed anything? <laughs> but it costs always. And the thing that 99.9% .9 of people I worked with in my life do not understand is total cost of operation. So, it's simple. You don't have to know SQL. You can go no SQL way. And it can be slow. And you can put another 100 servers there. And they will cost some money. And it will be slow again, and you will put another 100 servers there. And it will cost money, but it will work. And you can hire cheap developers, and you can hire stupid managers, and you can hire a great sales team that is going to sell all the shit you create. And it will work, it will cost arm and a leg. And your startup will show some progress. And you will find some money guy, how you call him, you know, that will buy it. You hit the ball in his court, and he's now solving all the problems. You have the money and you don't care. It's a good concept, okay? <laughs> Especially if you're from Balkan. Now, if you don't want to go that way and you want to do things right way, you will think about what everything costs. So, if your cost of the additional servers is going to be 100,000 euros, and the cost of a good developers is going to be 50,000 euros, get the good developers. If it's vice versa, go with shitty developers and buy more servers. I mean, it all comes up to how much it costs at the end. But you have to calculate all the costs. And you as developers, you don't need to know how to calculate all the costs. But few of you that are managers, go back to primary school and learn the basic calculus. Because 99% of the managers don't know how to add five numbers. So please. Uh, now, back to the technical part of, of all this. Uh, the conventional setup that we all think about is have uh, six layers of this, seven layers of that, attributes, connectors, gateways, and all the shebang we think about. And here be dragons, you know, the magic stuff. Database monitoring. Nobody's thinking about it. Oh, we just shove the data somewhere. It works. Um, Jean was 
talking to you about what they do in uh, what they did here, here last bookings, and how many servers they have, and the topology and everything else. So the the data storage is way more complex than people think about, because some of us started back in the day when it was. Uh, Global time, storing into text files, then we learned about B3 indexes, and then the, there was DBase, one, two, three, four, and you know, and w the Oracle came, and the other databases came, the MySQL became available, and we learned about some things, and it was all, you know, you can store some data there. Today we're talking about petabytes of data. It's not that simple anymore. Today, for a simple, stupid website that doesn't do anything smart, we are generating terabytes of data monthly. Because the managers are like, oh, I want to know where the mouse moved, where he kept his mouse. What, I don't know what I'm going to do with this data, but I'm sure we can sell it sometimes. Or we'll hire those guys that do database mining and you know, database science and stuff, and, and they'll figure something out and we'll make money out of it. So if we have data, we have to store it somewhere. It gets expensive. Monitoring is even worse than databases. Nobody thinks about monitoring. We're not going to be talking about monitoring today, but it's a serious topic also. So how to, how to figure out the magic? I mean, why is this magic? Why do we think of it? Is magic. Why do we look at the database storage as uh, a black box where we shove things in? Is it the shitty education we have? I mean, I know in our, in our local area here, the education is useless. I have no clue what kind of education they have it outside of this region. But usually you really have to go to database science courses to learn about how databases work. If you go to general computer science courses, the databases are like, ah, you store some data there. If you really want to know data, and then if you really want to know databases, you're not a developer, you go to DBA part, and you, and you, need, to, you need to be on the both sides. The information volume, I'm kind of older than most of you, but, uh, volume of data, as I said man, uh, just a few minutes ago, is rising, and it's rising incredibly fast. And we need to understand it. We need to understand that we have to deal with huge amounts, amounts of data. It's not small websites, it's not Web 2.0, it's Web 200 today. I mean, I, there is no logic to amounts of data we are dealing with today. Not only the, the big sites like Facebook or Bookings, I mean just the small sites, the small projects, the small startup teams of five people are dealing with terabytes of data. I have clients with one table that is like 150 terabytes, and they're startup six months old. <laughs> and they're like, oh, we didn't expect that we're going to get this much data. Yeah, but you're storing the path of the mouse on the coming, what else did you expect? <laughs> Add numbers, you know, five plus five plus five plus five, few million times, you know, gets you somewhere. Is the data complex? That's why people don't understand it. I don't know, I, I find data very simple, but I figured out that a lot of developers today don't understand the basic concept of data types. I'm sorry guys, but that's dis disturbing. Data types is something you learn in two weeks. You, you take any book of programming, the first 30 or 50 pages are about data types. I know seniors that don't understand data types. It's not good. If you think you know data types, once every two years, just go through those 50 pages again and remind yourself about data types. Data's not sexy, not paid enough. Trust me, a good guy that knows how to deal with data is getting way more money 
that the guy that writes in Python or PHP or C++. So requirements, yeah. Do we really need to know about that? So how to, how to solve the problem, how to uncover the magic, how to, how to get there, how to, how to become me? <laughs> so we need to understand the problem, yeah? We need to really understand the problem. We need to know what are we storing, why are we storing it, where are we storing it, and how we are going to use it. If you don't know how you're going to use the data, dump it as objects into Mongo, the Hadoop, whatever, and forget about it, and let somebody else deal with it you know, in 10 years. So, but really understand the problem. When you understand the problem and decide how to tackle the problem, check out all available tools. MySQL is the best database in the world, but it's not the only one and it's not the silver bullet. It doesn't solve all the problems. Oracle DB is the best commercial database system on the planet. DB2 is the second best. Again, they're not the silver bullet cannot solve all the problems. There are uh, niche products that can solve your problems in very cheap, very fast, and very easy way for you. The only thing is you need to know about them. And the best products don't hype. So if there is a hype about the product, it's usually because it needs a hype to be recognized. It's not that good. Most hypes go down, disappear. Many products that were very hype 15 years ago don't exist anymore. Many products that were hype two years ago doesn't exist anymore. Products that are hype now will probably go away in six months. So figure out all the tools that exist. And not only database systems, everything how you're going to monitor the database, how you're going to optimize the database, where are you going to store the data, what hardware are you going to use? Are you going to do it on-prem? You're going to do it in the cloud? You're going to rent someone that only stores your service for data storage? Whatever, check it all out. Spend three weeks Googling or duck goggling, whatever you outside of the box, that is always a good thing to have on a slide. <sighs> uh, the thing about thinking outside of the box is know the box. That is, know all the tools, understand where you are. For every expert, there is an equal and opposite expert. Understand that sentence. Think about that sentence. Every Monday morning, you can look yourself in the mirror and think about that sentence especially if you're a senior project lead, team lead, or a low-level manager. Top-level managers, they don't think. So it's just, <laughs> you, you, don't, you don't get them to, to, to do those stuff. So what are the problems that we want to solve? We want to solve availability and reliability. We want a robust data system. Unless we don't care about our data. That is a valid thing. If I'm storing all the data that is going on on my site, if I lose 10% of the data, I don't care, right? If I don't have today's data, who cares? I have data for six months before. I will have data for six, next six months. One, two, three days if I lose, doesn't matter. But incorporate that in the system so maybe Mongo is good for you. It's not consistent, it can lose data, but if you don't care about data, it's great storage. You need to understand that your data will grow. If you think your data will not grow, your data will grow more, okay? So understand that data grows, just like it. It gets ugly and loud, screamy, demanding, just like it. So you need to plan for scalability. 
there is a dual school in scalability solving. One is think about it in advance. So plan for scaling immediately while you're designing the system from scratch. And the other school of thought is don't scale until it's necessary. Don't even think about scaling until it's necessary. Now, I like the first one. So think about it in advance because I like to win. When I'm starting a project, I plan for it to succeed and I don't plan for it to be sold to someone, you know, kick the ball in someone else's court and let them worry about it. I want to make it work. Now, if you're not thinking like that, you can understand that, well, 90% of projects fail, so if my project fails in three months, I will definitely don't have enough data to worry about scalability or not enough users or whatever. So why tackle the problem and waste time and money and, and thought processes on, on, on thinking about something that will never happen because the project will fail in six months or a year or whatever. Now, as I said, I plan for 100% of my projects to succeed, so I plan in advance. If you're more realistic than me, you can go the, it's, it's a valid thing to, th to think about it later, but yeah. Performance, I really don't think we need to talk about performance. Everybody likes performance, everybody wants performance, managers demand performance. It costs money, you need to plan for it, you need to understand it. You need to understand where the pitfalls are, where you're going to lose performance and why. In bookings, they have a problem. They have a gazillion roles they need to read and show to people. And they have uh, real-time stuff they need to show to people. And you have uh, auctioning sites that need to show real-time data. I mean, people are clicking there. They, there is no caching on, on eBay or Coupon Pro Dem or Limundo Cupindo, whatever. No caching, no lag allowed need to figure out how to handle it. So you need to understand where the problems are going to be and to plan how you're going to solve it, how to design the system to solve those problems. And of course, you need to optimize in advance. The TC optimization in advance, not database optimization in advance. TC optimization is, as I said, a very simple thing. 2 plus 2 plus 5 plus 7 plus whatever equals whatever. And that versus 3 plus 2 plus 5, five plus 1, what number is bet, uh, bigger, go that way. There are servers. There are people that work for you. There are monthly fees. There are one-time fees. You need to see what your options are. You can go this technology with this many servers and this type of developers, that type of servers, that type of you know the, the design choices. You see what, what works for you. You want to plan on three, three months, you want to plan on three years, you want to plan on five years, it depends on your business model. But you need to understand your total cost of operation before you make the decision what road you're going to take and not take the road that you like at the time of decision making because your best friend is MySQL DBA and you want to use MySQL. So understand the cost, put it on paper, put it on a wiki, your internal local wiki, and in three months when someone asks you why did you decide to do this, you can go and you say, well, look, I mean, this was the cost for this, this was the cost for this, we decided to go this way. Not, you know, well, it sounded best at the time, it was hype. As I said, you need to know your tools. This is just an overview of how InnoDB looks like. Just a top-down look at one simple storage engine in MySQL. I'm sure 
that 80% of you didn't see this. And I'm pretty sure that 90% of you don't understand this. Probably right, probably wrong, probably wrong. The problem is, if you want to know that you are going to use InnoDB, you need to understand this as a developer, not as a DBA. You really want to understand where your data is going to be stored and why. You can find this, and as I said, this is just a top-down view, no high internal details, just it works like this. So we're looking here at one extremely simple view of a MySQL database. We have the clients, we have MySQL D, we have a few storage engines. The problem with this picture is that a good number of MySQL users don't even understand that this third line exists. It's sad. It's sad because a lot of things can be done by choosing the proper storage engine in MySQL. If you want a high transactional storage system, InnoDB is the right thing for you. If you want an archive, the archive storage engine is good for you. If you want to have a real-time database within memory performance with hundreds of millions of reads per, per second, you want MySQL cluster storage engine. So you need to understand first that those exist. Then you need to understand how each of them works and why. So you can choose which one of, you, of, of those are you going to use. There are some that I didn't put here. For example, there is a TokuDB storage engine, which has, uh, I think, two or three times higher insert capability than InnoDB. So if you're having a system where you have to insert a huge amount of data constantly, you use TokuDB. With MySQL, it's just another storage engine. So again, you need to understand what you're dealing with. What tools are you going to using and what tool, tools are available? Uh, now the advanced databasing. When you understand how the system works, you can use that system in an advanced way. For example, everybody who uses MySQL know how to use it through SQL interface. So you write your SQLs, you connect to MySQL using one of the connectors available for PHP, for Java, for C++ or C, for Python, for Ruby, for whatever. You connect, you write SQLs just with any other SQL database, you get results back and it works. Is it optimal? Sometimes. Is it always optimal? No. For example, if you know that you're using MySQL, now that's why I gave you the link to the, to the PDF so and you can look at it later, but this is the application layer and this is the MySQL here, MySQL D, yeah, right? Inside the MySQL D, we have the, the MySQL server that you connect with that SQL connector on and where you shoot the SQLs. And when you shoot the SQL to MySQL D, it needs to parse it, takes some time. If it's a six kilobyte, 12, 12 way join, takes the time to parse it, okay? then it should go through the optimizer. Optimizer needs to find the proper way to execute the query. Needs to know what tables he's going to use, what keys he's going to use, how he's going to merge the keys, how he's going to traverse the tables, where to pick up the data, how to sort it, and how to put it back. And then it needs to execute the query. And the execution then goes through the handler API and goes to a storage uh, system. Now, 
it's great for universal stuff, okay? You can write any SQL to get anything out of the database. But it's your application. You are getting the data. You know what data you want. And you're going to fetch the same type of data from same tables a million, billion, gazillion times in the lifetime of application. Do you really want or have to go through the optimizer, the parser, the optimizer, and executor all those gazillion times? It's not universal, it's a single query. It's a single type of fetching data. So can you skip that? And your application can talk with you know, DB API and fetch data directly from, from uh, you know, DB storage engine, you can. Any of you knew you can do that? So you can not write SQL. You can write instead of one SQL query, 100, 150, 200 lines of code. You can yourself, because you understand the database and data in your database better than the MySQL optimizer. For one reason that MySQL optimizer is not the best optimizer in the world. And for the second reason that no optimizer in the world can know the, the data better than you. So you can write the execution plan that is better than anything that optimizer can do ever and you write it directly. So optimizer don't have to go and fetch the statistic data, calculate the cost of all operations it's going to do, and decide what path to take to fetch the data. So what you do, you write it yourself. It's not simple, it's way more complicated than writing SQL. But you store a lot of time. You use an InnoDB API, you go directly to storage engine, you fetch your data. Or you put, you put your data in, it's the uh, same thing, it's a two-way process. Or if you're lazy, and we are developers, we are all lazy. There is a memcached plugin for InnoDB. You can use an existing memcached API and write key values and read key values from an InnoDB table directly using memcached API. Again, way faster than going through optimizer. Now, it's only a key value then. You cannot fetch and, and push multiple uh, uh, fields. But again, it's super fast. Again, moving away from just a database, you have memcached on your system. You're caching a bunch of stuff. You're using memcached and you want it to be persistent, okay? If you reboot your memcached, the data gone. You won't have persistent memcached cache. You drop memcached and you put MySQL, you have memcached API, all your application of just seeing it as a memcached, but it's persistent. It restarts, the data is still there. So you want persistent memcached, there it is, you know that? It's very useful, but you need to know about it. That's the, that's the thing. And the point is that systems that have these capa uh, capabilities, like MySQL, are not advertising it. There is no half a million euro uh, marketing campaign to tell you that there is a memcached uh, API inside MySQL or there is an InnoDB API for InnoDB. We don't care. We made it. If you're smart enough, you'll find it yourself. If you're not, it's not for you. So what I'm trying to pass here is that those things exist. Now, I know about MySQL stuff because I do MySQL. There's maybe some stuff with uh, MSSQL. Maybe Oracle DB also have this. Maybe whatever database you're using, or not only database, other systems can do it. 
uh, other ways of accessing MySQL. There is something called HTTP plugin. You can fetch data. It's not very optimal. Now, this is not optimal. This is easy. But sometimes easy equals fast equals reducing total cost of operation. Because you're going to get data many days before designing a connector from your JavaScript, blah, 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 blah. You hit this from JavaScript and you fetch data directly from MySQL. So you can get, you can execute SQL over HTTP, you can get a CRUD stuff, the REST interface directly from MySQL, you can speak JSON with MySQL directly through port 80. So no connector, no nothing from JavaScript, get URL, poof, it works. Not optimal, not super fast, but extremely fast to implement. So another side of optimizing things. You can go into DB uh, API, takes a lot of time to develop. You need a slower server, a less expensive server to operate. Here, an idiot can write fetch URL, but you need a higher server. So find the balance, find what works for you. This is uh, an example of Transactions per second on, this is, uh, I hate doing this when I'm reading my slide, but I'm sorry. So uh, eight CPUs, two gigahertz per CPU, 16 gigabytes of RAM. It's a Xeon server. So just, you, you cannot read it. So we are talking here 70,000 transactions per second versus 10,000 transactions per second, seconds. That's seven times speed up of using API versus going through, through SQL parser, optimizer, executor. Seven times speed up, that means seven times slower server, that means I think like 200 times cheaper server because the price for speed <laughs> don't go as linear as we would like. It's a, it's a nice, showcase of what you can save. Now MySQL cluster, it, it was my bread and butter for many years. Uh, it's an in-memory database. It's a storage engine for MySQL, so you can just choose it to be a storage engine. If you need to run join from MySQL cluster, you're screwed, doesn't work. I mean, works, but you can do it manually also, you can send data you know, through via DHL, it's faster. But if you need simple queries, it's great. It runs 80% of mobile traffic in the world. Verizon, Telenor, T2, O2, they all use MySQL cluster in the backend. Everything that is pushed by Alcatel or Ericsson, all their backends for, for mobile platforms, they're all running MySQL cluster. And now how you can access data in MySQL cluster. Again, you can use SQL. So these are the applications. And these are different, you know, there is a PHP connector through MySQL to NDB. There is a um, Java can go through JDBC, but Java can also go through cluster J and GNI. There is a direct to JSON access through Node.js. Uh, there is mod NDB for Apache. I have no idea how that works, never tried it, but it, it exists. So uh, probably you can store pages and call them with some, I don't know, I'm not an uh, Apache user. So There is also memcached. But here, uh, this is the daemon that acts like memcached, but it's using NDB as a backend. The good thing about MySQL cluster is it's in memory, so it's extremely fast. That's also a bad thing because you need to have RAM to put all your data in. It's expensive. But uh, it's high available, highly reliable, and highly scalable. You can 
destroy any number, of, half of the servers can go down, it still works. You can online add more servers, so your end of the capacity, or 80, 90% in, you don't have enough RAM, you add two more servers. You're again 90%, you add two more servers, and you can do it for a long time. Actually, no, but it's a good market. So again, you can, you can access it through different paths. And of course, NDB API is the fastest way to do it. SQL is, of course, the slowest way to do it. Uh, I think we have the example here. Yeah, there is. For example, this is, oh, kill me if this is Alcatel or, 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 or Ericsson. But for example, they're using SQL to do all the metadata stuff on the database. So create table, alter table, drop stuff. They do it through SQL. It's faster. All the system access from their systems, the HLR, VLR, uh, they, it's used, they are using either um, Cluster J or LDAP. Now, Cluster J is like the API direct speak with, uh, with NDB cluster. And LDAP, there is a, a very good one-to-one -one, uh, translation between LDAP and, and SQL. If you know how LDAP works, it's a, it's a tree. But you're always searching your tree from the root. You're never, you know, I want this node and everything below it. You always address that node from the root. So you always have uh, C, D, C, N, C, N, C, N, C. And because it's always from the root, you can imagine that as a plain table that has enough uh, columns as, was, as the maximum depth of your tree, and that is a primary key from first to the, to the end. So when you do a query, you always do a query through a primary key, and you have a direct, like, top you go to record because it's this and this and this and this and this and this, and you're, you find the record immediately. Uh, we wrote this, uh, it was my team who wrote the LDAP with NDB cluster backend uh, during the time Sun own, owned us, and it was faster by an order of magnitude, so like 11 times, than anything Sun had at the moment, and Sun invented the bloody LDAP. So they were crazy, they, they were like, how the hell did you do it? So you have the limitation, because the original LDAP can go indefinitely in depth, and we had the limit, you know, the number of columns in the table. But since all the customers we had knew their limit, it worked. So this is, for example, a good, good thing what they're doing. They're using all the different types. So they're using SQL, they're using cluster J, they're using LDAP. So they're using three different ways to access the same data. But the slow stuff that is management stuff that is written by a lonely poor developers is using SQL. And the high-end stuff that is in the core of the system that runs every time you pick up your phone, every time you change, you switch the, the, the cell, every time you receive an SMS, every time you do anything, it's recorded in this database. That stuff is using API, talking directly with NDB, circumventing everything else. Again, it can be used as persistent memcached. And here is the Graph, okay? This is the pink, just the pink, so nothing is done, okay? It's around 98 microseconds. This is the memcached directly, so you're running a memcached server, storing nothing. It's 184. And this is a one node NDB cluster, and this is a two node NDB cluster. Uh, there is no further more because four node, eight node, 10 node is, is exactly the same, like this one. So we're having, okay, it's slower from 
184, we went to 374. But we have persistent cash. And we have ability to scale as much as we want. And we have a single point of truth. You, you can have as much this memcached interfaces that your application is going to connect, and they will all have same data. And you don't have a problem with uh, memcached replication that doesn't bloody work. You have really, you know, as many memcached uh, interfaces that you can connect to that actually always return the same data. It can be used for whatever you want. You want session storage or... And this is accessing MySQL cluster between SQL and NDB API. Uh, note that it's logarithmic. So, <laughs> <laughs> so we're talking maximum 2.5 millions here and maximum 207 million reads per second using API. It's the same system. Now, uh, the X is number of data nodes used. Uh, I didn't test more than four nodes through SQL because it's, it states. But what's the number on the... Uh, on the X or the yeah. So where you have two and a half million, what's the number on the... Uh, Ten. No, 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 but the, the blue line. Where's the blue line? Ah, no, I don't know. <laughs> I mean, I... I, I it's just an apple spot. With, a, with, a lot of, with a lot of numbers, you know, but it's, if this is 10 million, like 50 million, maybe 60 million, something like that. Because this is 100 million, this is 10. So 50 million would be here, 70, it's like 60 million. Okay. So 60 to 2 and a half. Yeah. And it's, it's going up to 10, 10 data nodes because after 10 data nodes, this kind of goes flat doesn't scale that well with, with SQL only. With, with API, it scales rather nicely. Oh, well, you have to talk a little bit about Postgre, OK? <laughs> I mean, so uh, with Postgre, you also have stuff that are not like hitting you in the head when you install Postgre. Uh, you can use compression. You can use. Uh, uh, the columnar, co co uh, everybody knows what the columnar story is at, at all. No. Okay, the normal table is stored, the whole table is stored in a single file. And every time you read the row, you have to read the whole row. That's why when you are denormalizing your data to speed up reads, you cut the table uh, into horizontally so you get smaller reads because you always have to read the whole row if you're not reading from the index, okay? Now, if you're doing not this uh, transactional stuff, but you're doing the, um, the all-up stuff, you know, if you're doing some data mining and trying to figure out the data, you know, what we discussed before, uh, you rarely need the whole row. You need the part of the table. And if your tables are huge, uh, being able to read just a part of it is very useful. So uh, the storage engines that are columnar, they store uh, each row, each uh, column in a separate file. So you can read only the columns you need. That gives you a lot of flexibility. It's slower for the relational stuff, but it's great for, for uh, all up cubes and, and stuff like that, especially when you're doing this data analysis. In 99% of cases, you're reading the whole table every time. You don't have, you know, just 20 or 50 rows. You're talking about long running transactions, long running queries, reading a huge amount of data. So reducing the amount of data reduces IO, speeds up everything, makes stuff cheaper, etc. So you can, uh, they can, you know, have compression, which helps a lot on the I.O. Uh, since you're not usually running like 1,000 transactions in the same time when you're doing this type of operations, compression on the CPU doesn't slow you down. 
but the I.O., the, the, because you're reading a smaller amount of data from the disk, speeds things up a lot. Um, GPU acceleration. With uh, Postgre, you can have uh, queries that are accelerated by GPU. Uh, when you're doing full table scans and stuff like that, it can paralyze stuff and make stuff faster. It can sort faster. Aggregate functions are faster, etc. This is the data by you know that guy there yeah, with the long hair. You can he was doing all these tests. So this is, for example, th three different tests with three very different queries, and you see the the times. You know, the lower time, the better. So uh, not every solution is always better, as you can see. The GPU accelerated is the fastest on test one uh, and on test two, but it's not fastest on test three. So different queries, different type of data, you need to understand how things work. I'm not a PostgreSQL expert. You can ping him for this ex actual data. And also, uh, there is a list of sources at the end of the PDF, so you can go see his talk, see the actual queries, etc. Uh, Tokudub, I mentioned it already, that it can do way more indexes than any storage engine on the planet at the moment. Uh, this graph was made by Mark Allahan. And as you can see, I mean, the green one is InnoDB, the blue one is TokuDB, and it's like 20,000 rows per second versus yeah, 50 rows per second <laughs> after a while. Uh, they're doing this by implementing something called fractal index. I'm not smart enough to understand how that works. I'm sorry. I read the white paper, I think, 10 times. I spoke with Mark five times. They explained it to me. I, uh, just like you, you know. Uh, no idea how it works, but it works. I mean, to better understand your decisions, how your system operates, please do some monitoring. Please, please. There are different ways to monitor your databases. Here are some examples. If you are MySQL users, guys, Oracle is dirt cheap on support. And what you're getting is awesome. I mean, it's really not because I'm working there. I was suggesting people get the support from Oracle way before I was, I was employed in MySQL. Uh, an example, to get uh, best possible contract, the enterprise support package, it's $5,000 a year. Taking in, a, in account how much a decent DBA cost, I really think that's like peanuts. And with that, you get a whole bunch of add-on services, like MySQL Backup, like a Thread Cache, like a whole bunch of stuff. But what is the most important thing is Merlin, or MySQL Enterprise Monitor. I don't understand how anyone can run MySQL without Merlin. It is the most useful tool for database monitoring on the planet. You can get everything from it. I mean, you have a query that takes 0.01 seconds to execute. And it's taking mm, 200 hours of your database server in a week. Why? because it's executing millions of times a day. How you find it, you can't. Any type of profiling you put, any trap you set to, to catch the queries that are executing, this query is just going to go through because it takes 0.01 seconds to go. It's not a slow query, it's using index. It's a good query. You're just calling it 100 million times because you're an idiot. And I'm a DBA, 
and I see the database is going haywire, show process list is never showing me that query. <laughs> and I'm hitting my head, you know, I cannot solve the problem. Now, the only way to do it, you run the Merlin, you tell it there is, you know, show me cumulative time all the queries are, you know, spent on the database server, and sort, you know, and you see a query that is taking 200 hours. It's easy, you see the query, you go, you see some more on, put some include in some wrong place and something that should be cached, he is pulling from the database nonstop. You switch that to memcached or whatever, you solve the problem and pff, everything works. You could not do that without proper monitoring tool. Merlin, from heaven, I mean really. <laughs> Optimize your database. I wrote a good, uh, good series of texts about optimization on, on, my, on my blog, but it got hacked and I never wanted to, uh, don't need to, and I never wanted to put it back up, so you guys didn't want it, so. But optimize your database, normalize it, and then denormalize it, okay? If your database model making guy is denormalizing in head, fire him, okay? You want to normalize, you want to document the normalized version, then you want to denormalize and document what you denormalized and why. And in two years, when you are asking why the hell did we do that, go back to that document. Profile and tune your queries. This is from my previous talk. This query, the first one, uh, takes three to five seconds. The second one, one second. This is the query that goes for 10 minutes, and this one goes for 10 seconds. You will see the queries in the PDF. These are the sources. You can find more data too. Sources for the data I used here, sources for the other stuff, and pfft, I'm way over the time. <laughs>